Alrighty, let's talk cycles now. For many of us, cycles is one of the best things that has happened to Blender in many years. Uh, right up there with Beamesh Anywhere. It's, it's hard to say which one wins in my boat, but both of them are extraordinarily awesome. And this time around, Cycles has gotten a bunch of new improvements, um, many of them that were really required to adopt Cycles for production work. And so Cycles is getting ever closer to be a full production render engine. Um, I'm using it myself for a lot of production projects through the uh, studio side of CG Cookie, and I'm loving it. Yes, there's still some things that are missing for sure, but it's really maturing quite quickly and is a very, very good tool. So let's look at some of the new features that have been added in 2.6.3. Uh, the first one is background image support in render view. So when you're rendering in the viewport, if you have any background images in your scene, those will now show up. Makes it good as, you know, noted here in the release notes for a quick preview when making renders that are gonna be composited over actual footage. And the next thing then is active render layer in the viewport. This is actually one of my favorite little features that doesn't seem like a big thing, but is really awesome. So for example, here in the Blender material preview scene, uh, put together by uh, Thomas Dingies, we have a, let's put together a basic render layer. So if we just go ahead and render this real quick, I'll just set it to rendering while this is going. Uh, let me set up a very basic render layer. So here I have render layer here, and I'm just going to set it to uh, render layer two, which layer two in this scene, or actually no, layer two doesn't do anything in this scene, but let's just put a basic cube on layer two. So we're just going to put a cube on layer two. We'll move it over here and maybe move it up a little bit just so that we can see it. So here's what it then looks like. Well, if I wanted to say just render, or if I have just one, layer one in my viewport, but my render layer is set to render both of these layers. And let me just disconnect this so that I can change this. So now this, my viewport here is only rendering layer one. So if I just do this, set this to rendered mode, it'll start to render, everything's fine and dandy. But if I decide, well, I really wanna know what this looks like for this actual render layer, because maybe I've done all kinds of complex things here, I'm including or excluding layers, I'm masking things. Well, I can simply now click the render layer button and that will um, show in the viewport the actively selected render layer here, not the layers that you have shown in your viewport. So seems like a minor feature, but when you're doing production, you're working with a lot of different render layers, incredibly handy tool that makes testing a lot quicker. So I can just get rid of that. I don't need it anymore. But now let's look at the next thing. So the next thing on the list is layers and passes. One of the most prominent things that's been added is ambient occlusion support. Many of you will know what ambient occlusion is, but basically it allows you to have kind of self-shadowing and highlights on a global scale to just help fake a more realistic effect. It's not actually a real world phenomenon, but it works uh, very well for kind of cheating a little bit and adding that little extra bit of depth to your renders that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get in a short amount of time. So ambient occlusion can be enabled through the world buttons. So you just enable ambient occlusion here. And if we go back into our, our render view, we can see what it'll do. So let me just build the BVH here and then set it to render. Okay, so this is with ambient occlusion enabled. If I disable it, you can immediately see the difference. So this might be a little bit strong, but I can of course change down the, the distance here or increase the distance. Uh, any, you know, pretty much anything that you want to do, you can adjust that just as you could in the Blender internal engine. We can also set a factor value for how strong that global illumination should, or ambient occlusion should be. And the next thing though is we have ambient occlusion now enabled as a layer pass. So even if we disable this, which I'm going to do, and go over here and enable AO in the ambient occlusion, when I now render this over in the compositing nodes, we then have AO available as an option. So let me just do a very quick render on this. We'll just do say 50 samples. Let me get, rid of, get out of there and we'll just click image on here. We'll let this render. It won't take more than a moment. Okay, and here we go. It's rendering and we're done. So now if we have our ambient occlusion pass, we can just view that in the backdrop here and there is our ambient occlusion pass. So even though we disabled it in the world buttons, since we enabled the render pass for it, it's added the 
ambient occlusion, but excluded it from the combined result, allowing us to then just multiply this over the final effect any way that we want to then have good control of the ambient occlusion. So this is really, really great. Uh, next, though, is we also have several other options within render layers. One, we have full masking support now. So now, uh, just like before, if we have, say, another object, such as a monkey in another layer, say something like like this and he's on layer two or she actually and we just decide we only want to render layer one in this render layer but we don't want it to show behind that geometry we can just mask layer two and now when we render this by and previewing the render layer here it will mask out where the monkey is so this makes it much uh, gives us a much better control for compositing so that we can have uh, good, you know, different masks and such to then combine different levels of objects within our renders. So that's the uh, the masks. We also now have a, a full shadow pass support. Well, not full shadow pass support. Um, the shadow pass support is fairly limited. It does not currently detect uh, mesh lights such as these, which are the one really good thing in cycles that work really well. It, um, the shadow pass will only detect uh, regular regular lamps. And if we just look at it, you can see this is basically the shadow pass. And it works based on regular lamps, such as the sun lamp, an, an area light, or a point light. light. Um, but those lamps, except for maybe the sun lamp, tend to be a little buggy in cycles and tend to cause lots of noise. So it's, it's there. Uh, it's not ideal just yet, but it is really great for compositing if you know what to do with it. Um, next is environment textures or environment maps. For one, we now have float precision textures, uh, which just gives us, um, I'm not the right person to speak on this, but gives us uh, higher quality control and such for environment maps. Uh, we now also have full support for mirror ball textures. Let me just switch over to the release notes here. Uh, so mirror balls, so rather than just using the equilateral uh, environment maps, we can also use the mirror balls now as a projection mode. And you can do these simply by going over to the world nodes. And if you add in a a texture, environment texture, just change it from rectangular to mirror ball right here for your type if that's what you're using. So we have full support for that now, which is great. And along with environment maps, we now have a pretty awesome thing included in the camera settings that actually allows us to render a panoramic camera such as that you would use for an HDRI environment map. So you could actually create your own inside Blender for this. So if you just enable panorama under the camera, and go into render view, you'll immediately see what happens. We get a full 360 degree image of the area around our camera. And there you go. So if you have some specific things you wanna do with this, or if you wanted to create some kind of like studio light box environment maps, uh, you could do this quite easily by just rendering out a panorama and saving it out as an EXR file. So pretty cool to have support for that right inside Cycles. Uh, beyond that in Cycles, we've got a couple other things. Uh, for one, a very important thing is we now have a clamp option here. The clamp option inside the integrator uh, basically allows us to clamp pixels at a maximum value. And this is good for noise and firefly removal, uh, where fireflies being the bright white pixels that you tend to get, this will prevent those by basically saying, okay, the maximum value of the pixels can be this or that. By default, at zero just means it's disabled. But if we boost this up, you'll start to see the maximum brightness for these pixels is now 0 0.03. And obviously that's way low. And as this gets higher and higher, our image gets brighter and brighter until we get back closer to our original. Uh, and so generally, you know, you're never really going to want to set this less than less than one generally. But in a lot of, a lot of cases, 0.8 or something can, can give you a pretty satisfactory result. You just need to be very aware of what it can do to your image. So I encourage you to play with it and compare all the different values with your lights and such. Uh, the one thing to note is this will destroy caustics if you have them in your scene. So you'll notice that if I set this to zero and I have uh, caustics enabled, we start to see some cool kind of caustics coming reflected off the ball here on the floor. But as I put this up even at one, then those suddenly are just entirely removed and obliterated. Uh, this is kind of a downside where 
This is a tool that we, as if you use it, you're going to lose accuracy, but you'll get more, you'll get a cleaner render in less amount of time. So it's a catch 22. It's both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, you can use it if you need it, but just be aware of what it will do to your image or potentially will do to your image. Uh, we've got a couple other things, namely inside the compositing or excuse me, inside the material nodes. If we say grab this thing, we now have a color ramp node, which is really wonderful underneath. Uh, it'd be under converter. So color ramp is now an option that you can use. Uh, really good for creating everything from masks to gradients to you name it. You can use it for all kinds of things. We've got a color ramp node as an option. Uh, a few other little things that you can kind of explore with, uh, but that's about it for the cycle side. So a lot of, a lot of great stuff uh, coming, and I can actually tell you that in 2.64, we're going to have a whole bunch more cycle stuff that actually is, is almost too bad because already with 2.63 out, I want to be using 2.64 in the production side because of some tools that are already added that are really wonderful. But for the time being, with the addition of the ambient occlusion, the shadow pass, the mask layers, uh, the clamp option, cycles is continuously getting better and better and better and is quite awesome. So that's it for cycles. Let's go ahead and move on now to the uh, various other features.